My hope was to have the Wellesley students think about their own ambitions first, given that they are now at a stage in their lives when they have certainly thought about leadership, but they haven't yet faced the challenges of conflict of home and family that we've heard so much about with Sheryl Sandberg's book and Anne-Marie Slaughter's article. They are, in a sense, at a stage where their ambitions can be focused for their own future as individuals. I want to know what it is they hope for and dream about. And in order to spur them to answer that, I gave them some background from a study we did at Princeton and one we did at Duke on undergraduate women's ambitions for leadership. And we found some interesting patterns, which I can talk more about. But on the basis of those findings, I was encouraging these young women to have a capacious understanding of leadership, to recognize how important it is to aim for top jobs and not shy away from them, but also to recognize the value of leading behind the scenes and learning how to be managed in order to be a more effective manager. So it was an attempt to get them to think about leadership in a relatively pure way without worrying about some of the other obstacles they may face. What I was trying to do was to say, aren't there other obstacles? Gender stereotypes. People expect you to be kind and nurturing, and if you're not, then you're not being feminine, you're being bitchy or aggressive, and yet you have to be tough to make hard decisions as leaders, and they can't always be kind and nurturing decisions. Or popular culture. Women, girls, always being presented as sexy, provocative, rarely is making decisions or in a uniform or a corner office. So the images get embedded in our minds and it becomes hard for girls to free themselves from it and be prepared as young women to be leaders. And then finally, since this is a seminar on global leadership, how difficult it is for women in some parts of the world where the Taliban or other rigid doctrinaire movements prevent them from having access to education, or having any opportunities outside the home. I used two conceptions of possible scenarios for the future. I was trying to project the future imaginatively. And one scenario is convergence toward parity. Over time, with parity in leadership, gender equality, we'll get there. It may take a long time, but someday we'll have the same kinds of opportunities as men. If you're in a situation where you can't even get taught to read, the notion of convergence toward parity in leadership is going to be a very distant dream. The first convergence toward parity, however long it takes, will just continue the trajectory of more and more women moving into positions of top leadership, as we have for the past 50 years. The second scenario was differential ambitions, which it comes from an article by Barbara Kellerman of Harvard, that women don't really want what men want. We've seen the promised land, we know we can do it. Now we're going to go back to settings that are more like what women have always done. I think both of those are too simplistic. The point that I was trying to make in my talk is that a future worth striving for is a future in which there are not gender differences by who are in the top posts and who are in the behind the scenes supportive posts. Both men and women understand the advantages of both types of leadership and women have a serious shot at high-powered posts if that's what they want and more and more women are encouraged to go for it so that some of the gender stereotypes and popular cultural residues fall away. But that if that's not what they want, if what they really want to do is being a very effective, supportive secretary treasurer or managing editor, we need people doing that too. And if they want to form their own organization to combat climate change or tutor poor kids in Boston, God bless them, let them go on their way. But that all kinds of leadership, if you really stretch yourself and you have a goal and you don't shrink back, can be important for women as well as for men. The kinds of support that women give to each other when they're gathered in a kind of a feeling of sisterhood. We certainly had it in radical feminism in the 70s, but we were unwise enough to think that we didn't want it to mature and blossom into leadership. We all thought we ought to be equally there at every stage of the argument and every stage of the decision, so nobody could say, all right, this is what we're going to do and do it. Whereas at a Wellesley today, you can say people are working together to learn how to support each other and educate each other and learn from other folks here. But in the end, each of them recognizes that leadership means that I need to have an idea that I want to bring to fruition. And with all this support and with all this experience, I'm now launching myself as a leader and I have much more confidence that I can do it than I would have had if I hadn't had this Wellesley background.
Maybe the moment that was most important to me, though, as a leadership experience at Wellesley, I shared with the group today because we were in Pendleton in the current renovated version of what used to be that huge, bare, stark lecture hall that I remember very vividly from my own time there. And it came back to me just incredibly strongly as I walked into that room, even how changed it's become, that once as I was a sophomore, I was attending a lecture by a very famous, very pompous, very aggressive male speaker who was a theologian. He was standing at the front of the room behind the podium delivering obiter dicta over and over again. And I was sitting close to the back and he said something along the way that I had been studying. I just knew he was wrong. And I kept saying to myself, can I possibly get up and challenge this great guru? Here are some of my classmates and my professors and older students, and would I have the confidence to do that? So my first answer was, no, you know, really, I don't need to do that. I can ask one of my professors afterward. And then because he reiterated it and kept saying it in this pompous way, I finally decided, I can't let this pass. So I mustered all my courage, and I stood up, and I asked my question, and my voice didn't break. I didn't fail to get my question out. And he was a little bit flummoxed. He sort of went, well, harp, 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 harp. <laughs> and he sort of acted as though, well, it's not really a question I can take seriously, or something like that. But it was pretty clear to other people that he needed to take it seriously. And for me, that moment was, as you can see by the vividness of my memory, transformative. Because then I knew, even as a sophomore at Wellesley, I could get up, I'd have the courage to ask that question, and if he couldn't answer it, proved I was right. For this particular group in this particular setting, for me at Wellesley, the takeaway was Wellesley is an extraordinarily fine place to learn to be a leader. I talked about some of the ways it helped me as an undergraduate. I talked about how lucky they are to have the Albright program, to have each other, to have the resources that Wellesley brings, and how fortunate they are to have a woman's college emphasis on feminism in the highest and healthiest fashion. So leadership here is something they will be prepared for and experience, and they're going to hit the ground running when they leave. Leadership and Wellesley go together.